Hello everyone, welcome to Field Notes, an exploration of functional medicine. I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. So for today's Seaworthy podcast, I'm fortunate enough to be joined by the um, gifted person who has graced our clinic with uh, these images that are our, our motif, Carla Cope. Thanks for thanks for being part of the podcast today, Carla. Oh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and so we're here in front of Janet's trees, and for people to kind of figure out uh, what we're doing, we're starting with the punchline, and then we're working backwards, right? Because this is the last this is the last piece we did in a way. Um, to me, this is the conclusion because it's the backdrop for the podcast. Uh, I put it behind me when I work with patients on on telemedicine. So uh, over the course of today's podcast, we'll kind of tell the story of how your artwork ended up being here and um, what we've talked about in terms of art being healing and what have you. But I've got to say, it is quite a moment to me. Just um, your work here is, uh, well, it just, it's magic. So... Um, We had a, a um, we had a coach up here um, recording a class with me, and she just exclaimed uh, every day mm. just what it was like. What's it feel like to look at them now after you were seeing them in your studio and what have you? Um, you know, with with most of my artwork, once it finds its home, I feel detached from it in a way. Ah. Um, where sometimes I wonder if I go into a, a you know, a, not a trance, but a, a place in my mind when I'm working and thinking about projects that is separate than normal oh. life. So when things are out in their in the world, in their home, I I almost look at it as an observer, oh, yeah. not as a as a maker necessarily. Um, hmm, that's so interesting. And as I've gotten to know you over the course of all of this, it's just been so intriguing to me thinking about uh, making art as a kid and my mom saying oh you know Rob you could be an artist right like you're drawing and uh, things like that and so I've always wondered if an artistic process is part of what affects my functional medicine process mm -hmm. but again from the inside looking out I don't really have any way to know but there is um, I guess I think about a book of poetry I wrote when I was in my I, my 20s and I just self-published it got an ISBN Library of Congress number four, just because I felt like it felt really good. <laughs> well, it, needed to be, it kind of was uh, a, almost a burden. Like mm -hmm. um, I couldn't get the last poems done until I committed to write the book. I don't know why. And then um, when I put it out there, it kind of felt like a, a child, like it had a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had to deal with it being out there. And um, maybe part of the detachment was then that became because it became an independent entity. It was there was something different mm -hmm. about that, yeah. and then people have this different relationship with it, where they take it, and whether it's criticism or being inspired, or they have their own personal experience that is separate from you as the writer or the artist or the creator, which is is true with our children as well, right? Mm, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, um, so. Again, in keeping the, with this theme then, um, I think today's theme is art and healing, and we could do a three-day seminar on it, we could do a three-year doctoral thesis, we could do 30 lifetimes worth of investigating it. We'll put that on the list. <laughs> so, in the brief span of a podcast, I wanted to try to encapsulate while we're in front of the trees, and in a little bit we'll kind of go on a tour and work our way back backwards through how we got to here, but uh, it had... It had felt to me over the years like uh, the images of nature are a universal uh, message mm -hmm. of peace and uh, and being safe, and and so uh, so the thing that always felt the most peaceful to me over and over again from your images and from my own life out in nature was um, light behind trees, and that was kind of a recurrent visual motif. And so then um, my mom's chickadees crept in as part of the process mm -hmm. because 
it felt to me like having some living creatures uh, added a dimension to kind of the starkness of winter or early spring. But it also I mean, just life me. is still there. It's just dormant. Yeah, yeah, and there's some buds on these branches, so there's some, what I think of as kind of, I suppose, one you know phrase would be Easter eggs, but these are just beginning late winter, early spring to get ready for things that then you and I and our families and uh, community members experience as this explosion of green when everything leaves out at once. So, And that's not, not unique to Alaska. It, it is especially... Surprising here because it is so dark and and it takes so long for spring to come. But when it does, it is. I will, as we'll look later at the abundance painting, it is so green and vibrant, and you almost can't take it all in at once. Oh, I had that experience yesterday. I, I felt like I was in a movie because this year's greening up was uh, gray to wall to wall green in about a week. And every spring is different, but this one was just, uh, well, it sort of felt like we skipped spring. <laughs> no, that's it was not a true. very long winter. <laughs> I know, that's not true. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think about the first, uh, the first painting that you, the first time you saw my work that I believe, um, that you encountered it at Fennell Street Art Center, it was a painting of light coming through the trees. Um, mm -hmm. And at that point, I was living in the spruce forest, so it was. It was mm -hmm. uh, I was painting a lot of um, dead trees that that are still standing from the beetle kill. Mm -hmm. So the spruce bark beetle came in the late '90s when I was a teenager, and really changed how our town looked, mm -hmm. um, and how we think about or how, how I think about space and the permanence of things. Mm -hmm. um, mm. That these forests are are in constant transition, and just like our lives and um so that was that was the piece that you bought and then commissioned a larger painting of um that light playing through the branches and mm -hmm. and the way that it um abstracts and blurs and mm -hmm. um is in sharp relief to you know to our amazing skies that we have and then i think that janet's trees was um i had just been working with this live edge uh, local harvested wood and trying to play with that natural edge and um, so all almost all of the work that we have done together has been truly together about you know as this call and response of what you're looking for and feeling and what my hand can do and where my excitement and passion is <laughs> um, so it's been a very gratifying process in partnership with with you as a as a person and a viewer, a doctor, a healer, and a, um, a steward of space and, and people's well being, mm. that that uh, has been a very strong element, and that's where I feel connected um, mm. to to this space as a not as a, not just as a project, but as a, a cohesive whole. Mm. Um, yeah, well, to me, your images are part of people's healing process. And we talked, uh, we'll get to look at your notebooks a little bit later, but uh, uh, it's almost hard, my um, thoughts start streaming so fast when we work on these things together, it's hard to capture the little moments I want to share with our audience. But the, uh, the thing to me about functional medicine is that uh, this term life hacks is really fascinating. And there's actually a whole group of life hackers out there, and their phrase has come to mean something sort of specific. But to me, it's the fact that in functional medicine, sound, imagery, food, um, the piece of connection with others, etc., these are all elements of our healing process. And so the fact that uh, your images speak a universal language of nature, you work in other modalities as well, but that's kind of the one we picked as a universal healing message. The colors are of Alaska. Your palette is uh, vibrant in a way that Alaskans recognize this uh, work is inherently universal in its connection to anybody who lives here or anybody who visits here. And uh, it sends people a message that isn't, uh, it's a visual message of welcome, extraordinary things happen here as opposed to an articulation or a phrase on the wall. Mm. So personal on a, um, in a sensory 
way. Yeah, and uh, I got to give credit where it's due. It's so important in functional medicine to give attribution because essentially the whole thing is built on the shoulders of giants. And I don't know if it feels that way to you in terms of your art mentors or teachers. Oh, but, certainly. <laughs> but uh, but uh, my my uh, partner here in town at the Native Medical Center then uh, moved to Massachusetts, uh, did a fellowship remotely for University of Arizona Integrative uh, Health. And uh, that's Dr. And Andy Weil, uh, who many people know, super, super well-known integrative holistic doc out of Harvard and a luminary and a defining voice. But his program has published recommendations for creating healing spaces. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with the observation in the hospital that so many people observe that they feel sterile there and they feel like they're surrounded by machines and they... Um, fair or not, their perception is they're kind of being treated like a machine, right? Your pump ain't working. We're going to give you these drugs for your pump. But um, the data, this is the key thing. The data shows that these, uh, these sterile feeling environments uh, have better healing effects if you simply take the curtain, that's the person's privacy curtain by their bed, and put a mountain and a river on it. <laughs> and that's the tip of the iceberg. We're hardwired we're, for nature. We're hardwired for safety. We're hardwired for nature. And so what, talk about, I mean, investment to reward is just off the chart. And so Dr. Weil and his team, they have said that healing spaces uh, should be more like a home and less like a hospital. So they should have color, they should have wood, uh, they should have sound, they should have living things. And so that was a really easy case to make when I asked the hospital for support in making this a healing space. Uh, and I'd always conjectured about what it would be like to work in one of these spaces, but the actual experience of it has been incredible because for every person that comments, I'm, the rest of the patients are benefited by the space in ways that I think are unconscious and subconscious. And so I, I think that uh, the fact that you're in my um, overlapping concerns about what matters and how we can help and how we can be part of the healing process, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, definitely like the sum far exceeds the parts. And then we even get into local art and a local artist's palette is going to actually reflect, many artists are going to reflect the colors that they actually see here, which then resonates with people in a way they don't. It just feels right. Feels like home. Yeah. Yeah. There's a quality of light to this northern landscape that um, it, it leans towards blue. Um, these rich kind of grays and purple light in the winter. There, there are very resonant colors here, and it's like that anywhere. You know, you're going to have your own quality of light. Um, a lot of the time, as I was, as we were designing and working on these pieces, I was thinking about what it was like being a child growing up here. Because I grew up not very far from where we're sitting right now, through the um, through the forest and Spent, I spent so much time outdoors in in these kind of spaces, in the trees, in um, a glade of you know green devil's club that is just <laughs> with the light filtering through. And I think I think that we can all hopefully relate to that that feeling of um, it is for me of, of comfort and safety and and nostalgia of transition and time passing, um, that was, I think that was one of the things that, that propelled me in this work mm. from the very beginning. That feeling of being a, 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 a child and observing, and I, I'm an extremely visual person, um, and I also, I have very terrible eyesight, so <laughs> I, I've had glasses since, I think, fourth grade. Um, but the the other side of that is that I have this I have these multi levels in my life of how I can detach from this physical reality and that's one of them. I I have this instant abstraction mm. um, experience of the world every single day where light spills around sharp objects. That they're no longer sharp. They're they're rounded curves mm. and um, and that's just part of my and I think a lot of people's <laughs> visual sense, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really informed my aesthetic quite a bit, and I, that's something I'm wanting to push, push a little further. Um, hmm. 
But as a kid, I, I remember that time when I got used to just the, the fuzziness of, of the world and then getting new glasses and looking and going, wow, the trees have leaves on them. <laughs> 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 and so, great. like, you know, something that is a, um, <laughs> perhaps a negative or a challenge in life that really has informed an aesthetic and a, um, a way of observing the world and seeing these different mm. levels of, mm. of connection and disassociation. A blessing of adversity and part of your, mm. your process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, a, I think, an important time to underscore and add that the data is showing that it's not intuitive how we recover from, based on how one defines it. I mean, stress is what uh, defines how we grow, so it's a normal, healthy part of growth, and we know now mm -hmm. a lot of people have undue levels of stress, which then gets basically defined as, as trauma, and so how does art tie to that? Again, we could go on for weeks or months or years. It's an inexhaustible topic, but um, I was fortunate enough to attend the Functional Medicine Annual, Annual International Conference yesterday, uh, remotely, so, so three days. And uh, Dr. Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S, he has uh, defined this thing called polyvagal theory. The, the vagus nerve is our rest and digest, rest and restore nervous system, and it turns out in our evolution, in terms of how we connect with other people, and in terms of how we connect with peace and abundance, uh, this uh, nervous system being in charge so that fight, flight, and worst of all, freeze, uh, don't shut down our healing capacity. These are the key motifs. And uh, the, one of the first people I interviewed for the podcast, Heidi Hanna, she talked about um, these principles that she's aware of, which is that we heal from the ground up, mm -hmm. And this is why talk therapy isn't necessarily the most effective modality anymore. The, the trusting alliance of talk therapy is critical, but people uh, feeling their feelings or listening to tones that turn on the vagus nerve auditorially or having visual cues of peace and abundance and harmony. Mm -hmm. And so from a scientific perspective of healing, I think, again, this is one of the most powerful uh, life hacks uh, is to have these messages of harmony and then... Uh, your work, though, has always resonated with me as um, having a radiance to it, a quality of light, uh, which then is reminiscent of like cathedrals and cathedral spaces, you know, and so it sacred is always spaces. sacred, yeah. right? So if there's a sacredness, which translates itself into your process, which then translates itself unconsciously and subconsciously to the people who witness it, boy, is that making me a more effective, effective functional medicine doctor. That's something that, that's always intrigued <laughs> me that the 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 emotions and the um, personal intention that is put into a work of art does that translate to the viewers and and sometimes it does in these really magical and synchronistic can I say that word synchronistic ways <laughs> um, and then other people aren't able to pick up on that level or maybe articulate it but as you were saying you just it's like little little steps toward uh, towards something and when when somebody experiences something that I have made I I'm grateful that they have a positive experience um, I tend to sometimes find the negative okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always you know always pushing forward and yeah I, I have learned and I'm trying to integrate this that this moment of celebration of reflection is vital to marking time and space and accomplishments because it is so easy to just keep going and um, as as my skills improve and and as I create new ideas I and, and push ideas further I forget the small victories along mm. the way um, and that's that. That's the curse of perfectionism. So mm -hmm. to actually stop and celebrate and talk mm -hmm. and reflect on this is uh, mm -hmm. is part of that creative process that I have been. Uh, it's hard to do. It was hard to come in today <laughs> and and yeah. talk. You know, yeah. and and to slow down. Um, yeah. But I I really appreciate it as well because I it shows on a very visceral level that. 
my work is appreciated and um, important. Mm. It's important to me, and it's and to be have it be important to somebody else is is a huge gift. <laughs> well, we I think we both perhaps then have some issues with perfectionism, and uh, uh, so it's so fascinating too this concept of service because I have found that serving others, whether it's my family or my marriage or my community or my kids, my friends, that's that's been. Uh, the primary thing that has, uh, uh, you know, taken a, a, an inborn tendency as a kid to involute, uh, overthink, be top heavy, top down, uh, nothing's good enough for whatever reason. I don't know what the genesis of that is, except for what's called negativity bias, which is I might, yeah. <laughs> there's this survival trait, right, where we have to focus more on whether or not there's a wolf in the woods than whether mm -hmm. the bluebird is beautiful because. If you unduly focus on a beautiful bluebird, <laughs> you get taken up by the wolf and you don't procreate, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, negativity bias is something that in a world that is... To keep us alive. Well, in a world that is unduly uh, filled with threats relative to our ancestors, then we've got this problem. We've got another life hack we have to achieve via mindfulness or positive psychology or art or life hacking, uh, you know, et cetera, where we have to live in a world with more threats than uh, our ancestors did. Do you think so? Well, um, I mean, we, we, we have shocking levels of comfort relative to the majority of humanity. So a lot of people who are listening to the podcast, their heads are exploding. They're like, you're wrong, you're wrong. But I think of this uh, issue of, of cumulative threat on our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there's a reasonable argument that the pre-agricultural people who lived in parts of the world that were relatively abundant, the rock slide or getting taken out by a wild animal or, or famine, which was actually part of physiology, was the, the argument is that the part of our nervous system that runs our response to that only needs to run about 1% of the time. And mm -hmm. about 95% uh, plus the rest of the time, our vagal uh, tone is dominant, which is rest and digest, rest and restore. That's our immune system. Uh, fertility, digestion, et cetera. So my premise is that now we've got, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to delve into it unduly, but we've got a world with cumulative toxicity, nuclear weapons, you know, escalating conflict, uh, epidemic levels of mood disorders, uh, our, our kids um, having more and more troubles that kind of don't make sense to us as parents. And these are like seven examples out of 100, mm -hmm. 200, 300. I think that cumulative threat, like from a Jungian perspective, is a burden on our collective unconscious. It's this like weight. And so I think artists and healers in our age, one of our challenges is how do we get into a space of rest and digest, rest and restore, abundance, when we sense this cumulative sort of uh, drag or threat. So hmm. makes me think of expectations, what, what our expectations are for our daily lives and for the need to be entertained and distracted from our feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and right. I, and, and it, it's not a, <clears throat> it's not a clear, excuse me, <clears throat> frog in my throat. It's not a clear <laughs> um, line between, I just lost my train of thought. This is a burn cube. <laughs> well, um, I, the, the thread I was, uh, picking up on there is, oh, oh. is escape versus connection That's or exactly. escape versus experience. So when I, when I think of myself as a child, I think of drawing. I mean, from the tiniest person being able to hold a pen, creating worlds and pictures and ideas. And in reflecting back, it, it is a form of escapism and it is a way of, of controlling the environment that can be scary or overwhelming or um, confusing or receiving mixed messages. And I, I feel that that now as, a, um, as an adult, as a parent, as a citizen, that the, the, the desire to escape and, and find some sort of um, peace Oftentimes, for me, that's watching TV. It's, mm -hmm. it's like these other, uh, um, these other ways of distraction come in. Um, 
overeating, addiction. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I don't have an answer necessarily, but I do feel that, that art for me plays that line between a space that, that activates that meditative, exciting, mm -hmm. interesting, completely engaging world inside of, and maybe it's a vagal nerve, <laughs> <laughs> where, where the, the hyper-focus of creating comes in, which I think is so very human. Mm -hmm. We all want to make, whether it's worlds in our, our mind and our imagination or... Um, I mean, a myriad of, of, mm -hmm. of ways of being and finding that, that creative outlet. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of the uh, privilege of knowing you is I think of you as the archetype of the artist, right? You, your day-to-day -day experience of the world, some things you've shared, <laughs> your way of relating to the world. I mean, some people have an artistic thread. I would describe myself that way. Maybe more importantly, others, my mom being the definitive expert, would say, you know, I have an artistic thread in my relationship with things. But, um, I mean, some people I've met over the years are, I have a friend who's the pure archetype of the writer, mm -hmm. friend in Montana. He's a really good writer. That's what he does. That's what he loves. I think it was a wise thing for him to pick um, what his innate nature is responsive to. Uh, but um, this, uh, I didn't fully uh, think about a dimension of this until I interviewed Dr. Natasha Falahi, who's a a doctor down in California, and she talked about uh, empaths or intuitives, mm -hmm. and she flagged it that um, those of us with that trait, and I don't know how many or how few they are, but for you, you might watch TV rather than make art. For me, I might read sci-fi or, or fantasy rather than read functional medicine in my free time, because I'm tending to experience functional medicine all the time. I think about, I'll have cases, uh, aha moments about my cases at three in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I it's find- the same with coming up with ideas? Yeah. And... My, my ideas need room to breathe, to become fulminant and beneficial to others. So I'm, I'm not a good candidate to do 25 cases a day of uh, you know coughs and pneumonia and lacerations. I certainly did that part of my career, but um, sort of each patient now is a, is like a creative endeavor, mm -hmm. needs room to breathe and room to kind of uh, metabolize the information. And then I was always, uh, Michael Stipe, the uh, singer for R.E.M., I learned a lot about him over the years just because I was always moved by the music and it occasionally, you know, it was transformatively helpful to me during times that were challenging. And so I saw him interviewed by uh, Stephen Colbert right uh, you know, before the pandemic hit, and uh, Michael Stipe reported that um, a person he trusts had, had told him that he was like a radio antenna, mm -hmm. like almost the size of one of these big dishes that listens to space, right? And they just advised him to like basically sort of drop out of the news for a while, mm -hmm. because when you've got your feelers out that far, then um, it's easy to get into overwhelm. And so I think another issue about art and healing and minimalism is uh you know the irony of the age we live in now is the data is in about food stress management social connection movement uh etc uh why and how we're healthy versus not many of our challenges are how do we streamline this down mm -hmm. and if we're empathic or intuitive we sometimes need to do things that aren't about reading another book but about stopping to digest a book we read, or uh, a minimalist who I'm releasing this class with, Heather Artema, she says some of the most important things we do are let go of things, not acquire new things. So again, I think about... Yeah, making space. Well, and we didn't talk about it yet, but this space, um, I've got a personal clutter problem, just because I never thought about all the stuff I accumulated, but I knew intuitively when this clinic was remodeled that the things that sent the healing message needed room to breathe. And I've heard that described over the years as the, no, uh, the space between the notes and the music. Mm -hmm. And so your work wouldn't resonate here if there were, you know, stacks of books and papers. And uh, I, I just know it wouldn't uh, pop in people's consciousness cleanly if there was clutter here. So there's also what I think of as a minimalism or an elegance, which is... And it's, it's the true, it's the, it's the same thing as learning how to be oneself or I this morning before I came over I was thinking about 
allowing myself to be the artist. And it, it's taken a long time to understand that I'm not good at everything <laughs> and I don't have to be. Mm -hmm. um, and as I discover my own neural divergence and how that affects daily life, I am able to let go of those personal expectations or personal perfectionism that I am supposed to you know, be this amazing housewife or <laughs> be able to write a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. questions pre podcast mm -hmm. where I'm like the like being being more fully comfortable and at home in our gifts and talents. I I I know that I'm good at finding connections between ideas mm -hmm. and my brain I need that stimulation of another person who's working on that level in their own, you know, their own branch of that same river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> that's where I, I I need that time by myself. But I I love having the connection between other artists and thinkers, and um, it reminds me of when we were working on on this concept initially thinking about neural networks and how we create pathways in our brains and um, and how that there are so many forms in nature from the absolute macro cosmic to micro to even smaller than that beyond mm -hmm. that into um, mm -hmm. what's the small uh, quantum <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> you right know, that, the quantum physics level yeah that yeah. Uh, that these these forms continue to crop up <laughs> and mm. that we can mm. um we didn't we didn't want to do a painting of a brain but right it's okay that it might remind one of but that. those branches right above your head uh still have the fern-like dendritic structures of nerve cells and under your feet and that and that <laughs> yeah. every single um tree is communi can communicate with its neighbors and and not just trees but interspecies inter yeah. um Variety, and I think I think you know as a as a thinker and a maker and a, just a human in the world, we need those relationships with not only other people but with the, our spaces and our environment, mm. our animals, our um, our feet on the ground. Right. Well, the data is showing that, and then there are ancient cultural traditions. Uh, I learned from the same coach, Heather Artema, who has so many interesting, illuminating things. Uh, to share, and I'm sure that's why we ended up doing a class to, together because we think our our message is far more effective together than alone. But she advised me that there, I believe, there are doctors in Japan. This is now third hand, so if I'm getting this wrong, it's on me. I'm sorry, but uh, they prescribe bathing in nature, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, um, and I feel like we're kind of lucky enough then to live in this incredible, you know, <laughs> well, going you know, to the beach and feeling that. That. Opening our door, mm -hmm. sitting on our deck, opening the window, looking through the window. Um, well, let's use this as a segue then. And so for our audience, this will be continuous. They're gonna, we're going to switch to a gimbal and give you a little tour of the clinic. And the very first artwork I saw of Carla's a number of years ago. And um, conversation will continue there. So here we are in the uh, second part. And we've got your commission piece behind us there and it's kind of queuing off of me but um, what we can show folks here is this is uh, this is reminiscent of the very first tree that you did Carla so here are these little bright dots that hopefully people can appreciate as I scoot in on it there's a little bit of red and orange and what have you and as as we talk about that then um, you know I saw the spruce trees you did that were maybe like 10 inches wide and a foot and a half tall over it at Benel. And um, the thing that stood out to me was that uh, like they had colors in them that were like Christmas trees. But then years later when we commissioned this piece and you and I talked about it, um, you said that the colors were there because the piece wasn't complete till it was complete. And now, mm. if you scoot a little to your right, we can see another thing here in your work. And this is what I what I describe or think of as like the radiance or the luminosity in your work. But the trees are limbed, L-I-M-B-E-D, in light, with that white. 
So to one person it might be snow, but to another person it might be the light wrapping around the branches. And from the perspective of art, I think again of what you educated us, which is that the, like the piece isn't complete until it's complete. There are many, many layers and that, that's part of my process is finding the image, going back and forth between light and dark. Um, the edges of things are, are often blurry because mm -hmm. I want to, um, that, that the first stroke of a paintbrush has a real beauty to it but it it's not quite yeah maybe it's not quite finished or enough and for me until it um i have to i have to kind of keep working to find the edge uh -huh. so it, it's it's not always that things become more defined it's that there's this back and forth conversation that happens between light and dark that informs the like the resonance of of the piece for huh. me so it's it's not really about landscape as much as about light. The light is, is the brightest thing. Yeah. It's fun to look back at, at older work and see how things have shifted and how things have stayed the same. Uh, yeah, I love what you said about your process. So why don't you, um, let's see. Let's uh, go over here now. <laughs> it's following you. you. see the clinic? Yeah, it keeps glomming I think this is me. the first one that that you this purchased is, that yeah and so um this is a good chance to educate people a little bit about um well this is pretty good <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can get it back on both of us all right so here we are and um asia freeman over at banal arts center she said, hey, you know, um, if you love Carla's work, then this one's available already. And I said, well, does it help local artists if we, you know, if we uh, display their work? And uh, she was so polite, but she looked at me like I was a moron. She's like, it helps local artists if you buy their work. <laughs> so life is infinitely humbling. <laughs> that, well, that's something that we talked about with, with our... Uh, more recent project that there are a lot of expectations that that artists get to do what they love and they should give things away for free and I do a lot of giving but to actually be paid what you're worth in in the time and the experience mm -hmm. and the journey that you're on to, to be paid real money in the real world for your work my work which is it's work. It's it's mm -hmm. it's something I love, but and it's my life work. But it is something that that deserve artists deserve to be paid, mm -hmm. and to have that that reciprocity and um, understanding with a hospital, a doctor's office, a clinic um, is very empowering for not just you know an individual, uh, but to recognize and respect artists for what they do and, and the, the work that we do. It's really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So this is the one that re uh, that's so beautifully said. So this is the one that reminds me of uh, being in a cathedral because to me this is light, light coming through panes of uh, glass. Uh, but it also to me has that dendritic pattern of like nerves and neurons. Um, but just the golden white quality of the light, I just, you know, literally every day I'm here in the clinic, this is like, this is part of me bringing my A game to my patients that I get to see this every day. Okay, now it follows. So now we are in front of Autumn Fire. And uh, this one uh, is a triptych. It's currently gracing Dr. Bolling's General Surgery Clinic. And uh, it will be in between the doors of uh, rooms if and when the functional medicine clinic grows to multiple exam rooms and what have you. And uh, it'll be over here. Uh, if we rotate oh, now, how do I go? Okay. If we rotate now, <laughs> look out the windows. Okay. So do a, uh, a 180. Then that, that wall over there, it's kind of uh, saturated in light. That is Behind where my the, hand there? Yeah, that's where the education center is here. And um, we'll move the artwork over there behind a recording studio to teach uh, 
uh, cooking classes at some point. But right now, this is a safe place for these works to be until the hospital expands. So, um, I think originally this was, you know, by by having it be a triptych, it's parts of a of a greater whole, and that yeah. we can. I think originally we they were going to be, it was going to be along a hallway so that it it's actually physically broken up by doorways, but that it is continuous right. um, and continuous image. Right, and it will be. Uh, so not if, but when, uh, just because this model I think is so effective for people that over the years we're gonna need more spaces and more exam rooms, but it's got a safe home for right now. Yeah, if you go down a little bit further yeah. with the gimbal, then people can see the top with that beautiful. And this is kind of what it feels sky. like to be in <laughs> in the fireweed fields and the grass fields. Isn't this something? <laughs> yeah. And and I, I, you know, it makes me feel like being a kid or walking through these beautiful yeah. landscapes that are changing oh, yeah. from that abundant uh, green spring summer that we were talking about to this, um, these colors that, that come out with with the autumn, with the changing weather, yeah, where it's still beautiful in its own way and um, almost envelops you in a, in a space that's, that's oh. bigger than. Oh, me too. Yeah, it just speaks to me so much. All right, so Carla and I are wrapping up in front of Abundance here. And this one, I'm just going to get us out of the way for a second, just let it float for you. But you can see... For so many, that's going to be evocative of how it feels to be on just an incredible day with just all that light coming through. And um, and so it comes full circle back to the light that was so inspiring in the in the first one. And those uh, the tree in the first one was a beetle kill tree, and then this is like new foliage from that mm -hmm. from that year in Alaska. And so I think that's what people's process in functional medicine is too, whether it's uh, our healing journey, our personal journey, our spiritual journey, they're all related and they're cyclical. And then as we return to these themes, sometimes each successive cycle has additional dimensions of complexity or abundance, which are an enriching. I'll think of it as a spiral. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like, so it comes around and yeah. around and, and yeah. as a metaphor for a lot of, a lot of parts of life. And then the poet Yeats, he said that uh, there's these expanding gears, like the top of a tornado smaller than the bottom, or as a hawk soars upward, each um, you know turn is similar to the turn before it, but in a way it's different because it's going farther out from the axis of the center. And so I think as we um, uh, you know corkscrew our way along through the healing path, then uh, these uh, these later turns in the jeer um, that he talks about sometimes are the richest or the most powerful because we're up higher if we use the metaphor of the hawk or what have you or um, you know we see extra dimensions that then we can sort of fly farther and faster mm -hmm. and even though each cycle is similar to the one before it in other ways it's it's different but, uh, well the question I'm left with is what's next right right and that's the excitement we want right that's what propels us forward and so these now have a life of their own. They're they're out there, and this is a watershed moment. And you've talked about how your drive is to keep making this art. Um, that's your process, and my process is to keep doing um, functional medicine until the wheels fall off. And hopefully, <laughs> in the meantime, other people will be inspired to do functional medicine and join Seaworthy and uh, take over where I let off. And it just it just keeps cycling. I think. Thanks a ton, Carla. This has been oh, a total blast. Really, really. Um, words have can't a express. Of yeah, well, words can't express my gratitude. Maybe it doesn't come naturally to either of us, but I think it's important that we did it. So thanks again. Check out her work at carlakcope.com, uh, and there will be connections on the show notes. Enjoy the rest of your beautiful day. Thank you. See where they exist for people to overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Please consider subscribing, giving us a five-star review if we've earned it, and going to our website podcast tab for any questions or comments you'd like to share with us. Thanks.